James O'Brien today had a very interesting piece, and and incidentally, both James O'Brien and I, I think, confused an IT outage with an internet outage. Of course, it's the IT outage, but the underlying systems, the underlying concern that I've got remains that we live in a very vulnerable world if a system which is designed to protect us from uh, abuse can actually end up causing it. And when we rely on an automated system to help us, that automated system closes everything down. That is a problem. And it's a problem inherent in having too many having having too many computers on the same system having too many computers dependent on one particular tool and it doesn't really matter whether that tool is the means of communication or a thing that tries to aid communication the the problem is that it's it's one monolithic system uh and but, but James O'Brien was talking about the difference between Boris Johnson, who he pointed out transferred funds from pandemic response to uh, prepare for a no-deal Brexit. So drawing the same conclusion that I drew and that The Guardian drew, that the COVID preparations were severely damaged by the or our COVID response was severely damaged by Brexit. Uh, he points out that Boris Johnson and Theresa May uh, get off scot free because they are the people who were transferring those funds, uh, particularly Boris, whereas a group of people who were indulging in perhaps uh, perhaps uh, um, irritating protest but peaceful protest found themselves or find themselves doing 21 years together in prison and the prison places that are now opened up for them have been vacated by violent criminals who have been released early. I think James O'Brien raises some interesting points there about the oddity of our current justice system. I think our current justice system is badly in need of realignment and it needs to think. It needs to think less. So if you go back to the 1880s and there will be at least one person in the comment section who suggest that I live in the past. Um, uh, he likes to think or she likes to think that I live in the 1960s, Professor Poppins, but uh, I, I have no problem with, <laughs> with pushing it back to the 1880s and Gilbert and Sullivan. Gilbert and Sullivan mocked the idea of the punishment fitting the crime. The punishment is there as in part a deterrent doing a better job than Rwanda, of course. And it's in part a way of separating an, a, a difficult part of society and ideally educating them to be better. It's about reform, re reform of the individuals, reform of the system, and it's a gradual process. I think we've abandoned that idea. And so it's important now that we have a a reformation of justice, not just of the prison service, but of the entire system. And I am increasingly horrified by stories about people who cannot even get to trial, uh, either because the system is so tardy or because the bureaucrats, and again, somebody will snarl at my mentioning that word, uh, or because the bureaucrats get in the way and prevent the gatekeepers get in the way and prevent the cases going forward to the judge or to the court and this is particularly significant and particularly telling and particularly 
repetitive and um, uh, and routine when it comes to whistleblowers in the NHS? Is there something that distinguishes these people? Is there some reason why these people cannot be heard? There are many areas of our social life that need reform, but there is an overarching principle, and that is that our our social life, our, our, our community, and that, that, that word in itself is a slightly silly idea. It suggests that we have individual communities which are in some way superior. Uh, Starkey was talking about this earlier uh, today, I think, um, and, uh, and, and he's quite right. We have one community. We have one community, and that's, that's our national and our international identity. And although we have smaller communities within our nation, they are subservient to our national identity, and our national identity is subservient to our global identity as neighbours of um, neighbours and allies of other nation states and entities. But this idea that this idea that our local community. Our, our community, our, uh, the, the LGBTQ community, has in some way eclipsed the British community is absurd. It's within our British identity. The Asian community is within our British identity. And we are in danger of fracturing our society. I wouldn't use the word ghetto because that has a very specific historical purpose. But when there are individual communities that somehow think that they are separate to and different from the rest of our country, then we have a problem. But we should, of course, celebrate the differing uh, aspects of the, the the differing parts of our society. Of course, we should. That that that's a that's a um, a positive of diversity. Um, and as for as for the, the, the this uh, this idea of the law, the law should be blind, and every part of our law, every part of our education system, every part of our police system should be there to support our society. And there is only one ambition. There is only one uh, goal, and that is perfection. And yes, we recognize that we cannot attain perfection, but that shouldn't mean that we set our sights on something less. We set our sights on perfection. Uh, it, 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 it's even got religious resonance. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Even if we recognize that no one is perfect but God alone. Those two, the, 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 those two religious verses have a purpose in our national life. And that is why we have images of perfection all the way around our society. Whether these are embodied by the monarchy, literally embodied by the monarchy, or whether they are embodied by icons of reverence, like the flag, like the, 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 um, the, the great positions that people occupy. And that is our, that is our mission. We will never achieve it. But it shouldn't mean we stop trying. So every part of our society can be improved. And at the moment, at the moment, we are in danger of slipping down the sinkhole of self-indulgence and introspection. Where our obsession with ourself in Brexit has brought out the very worst in our society. By all means, have Brexit, but get a Brexit that 
re-establishes our relationship with our neighbours. It's not about divorcing ourselves from our neighbours, it's about re-establishing, realigning our relationship. And when it comes to the amount of money that the Just Stop Oil people have cost us, uh, that their protests have cost so much money, yes, they have. Brexit has cost us more money. Brexit has piled up more traffic than Just Stop Oil. I don't know whether anybody has has, has tried to um, uh, get to the ports. Disaster, going down to Dover. A, a, a miserable experience. We need a better, a better overarching principle, and that is to better our society, we, to, to aim for perfection. And if we don't aim to perfection, we are doomed to failure. So we need to reform not only the NHS, not only the uh, police force, but also the judiciary. And that means stripping out the rubbish. And again, uh, to come back to our bureaucracy thing, or my bureaucracy thing, I'm not opposed to bureaucracy in principle. I think it's a good thing, providing it's supporting the systems. But when it takes control of the systems, and when the bureaucrats are paid more than the people who actually do the work, I think there's something wrong. And when I look across particularly at the NHS, and when I hear stories from the NHS of bureaucracy failing, and know that from my own experience it failed on each occasion I was involved in going to, um, going to have surgery or going, or going into a hospital, each occasion it failed. It was the bureaucracy, not the surgery that failed. It was the bureaucracy, not the nursing that failed. It was the bureaucracy, not the cleaning that failed. It was the bureaucracy. Uh, I have to ask, why are the bureaucrats paid so much? Because look at the look at the salaries of the chief bureaucrats who run the NHS trusts and then look at the salaries of the junior doctors. It makes no sense. No sense at all. And I'm afraid there are parallels in education and there are parallels certainly in the law courts, though in the law courts for the most part the judges and the uh, senior barristers do seem to uh, take home a fairly uh, fairly hefty wage, but it's these gatekeepers that seem to be making legal judgments when they really should not be. And it begs the question, are they doing the right thing? What legal training do they have? How, how do we trust the law if we can't get to it?